Hello and welcome to class for um, loss, grief, and dying uh, for the the uh, class of Monday, uh, March twenty third. Um, welcome back from spring break, and um, I want to begin by thinking about all of those who are uh, currently impacted by the losses of coronavirus and also just the incredible disruption um, that this has placed on your families and your educational process. Um, I'm praying for you and I'm thinking about you during this time. Um, I'm also going to confess right off the bat that I don't uh, feel completely comfortable doing videos. And so um, when I heard this was the, the way that uh, we were going to do things, I was uh, unhappy, but also um, trying to make it better. So I hope that um, this will be a chance for us to talk a little bit about the reading ahead of time, and then we'll have a chance to meet together over um, Zoom on Monday morning at 9 a.m. And also, during that conversation, we'll have a chance to kind of um, really spend time face-to-face -face as much as possible, I mean, through the computer, but spend time checking in about our feelings and seeing how we're doing. Um, I'm hoping that the, the faith of uh, your own religious tradition is helpful for you during this time and that you're finding ways both to check in with yourself and also with those who you care about. Um, I know that when you face uh, a societal grief or a trauma like coronavirus, you're also probably um, re-experiencing some of the recent losses in your life as well, even as you're wondering uh, about, about the future and what's coming next in terms of your loss. Um, and so my thoughts are with you in that whole process. Um, and let's just see how our conversation develops today. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, that I feel like uh, I want to just review briefly some of the things we talked about last time. Uh, last time we were talking about constructive bereavement models. And so those were models for after the loss has happened. Um, what occurs in your uh, mind after a loss in that process of kind of trying to put the pieces together again. And we looked at several different resources for that. Um, McGoldrick, I guess, was probably one of my favorites. And McGoldrick's emphasis in that chapter was about how to help families deal with the echoes of the past, those ghosts from the past previous generations that impact um, current functioning. Another important resource that I feel like we just barely touched on was the dual process model for coping. And that model um, had a track one and a track two for bereavement care. Um, track one, if I remember this right, has to do with your activities of daily living. And, um, oh, by the way, these authors developed the two-track model of bereavement care in the context of traumatic bereavement. So they were studying how um, what constitutes a traumatic bereavement and how do people cope with a traumatic loss? And they came up with this two-track model for coping, arguing that track one was the activities of daily living, the biopsychosocial that are often interrupted by traumatic bereavement. And then track two was how do you make sense of the, the impact of your loved one in your life? And that, um, the two-track model, I think was a little confusing for some of you or you were wondering why I assigned it. And I realized later I hadn't explained well enough that um, I encourage people in all kinds of bereavement uh, to go back and forth between the two tracks when they're doing uh, pastoral care with grief work. So if you're meeting someone who's grieving, uh, even for the first time, you might ask track one questions. You might ask them if they're able to get food or um, if they're able to take care of themselves or fasten their buttons or something like that. And you might also be asking track two questions. So um, in what ways do you seek to remember your loved one? Or how do you remember your loved one from day to day? What, how do you want your loved one to be remembered? So I encourage people, and you can even, pre you can even um, predict ahead of time that that's what you're going to do. That you're going to go back and forth between these two different kinds of questions. So um, now we're ready for today's conversation, which... Um, has a bunch of different titles in it, um, anticipatory grief, chronic sorrow, uh, 
and um, ambiguous loss. And so we're going to focus on anticipatory grief in this first part of the conversation. Um, and we're going to look at one of the most important um, original works on anticipatory grief um, from a book called Loss and Anticipatory Grief by Therese Rando um, and a, with a foreword by Robert Fulton. <clears throat> and this book goes back to 1986. So I'm getting purposefully giving you some of the classics in grief theory um, so that you can expand your vocabulary for grief. Um, and we're going to touch on why I think that's important. Um, I think why, uh, I think we have a limited grief vocabulary because a few grief theorists have um, created very easy to remember models that have started to shape our thinking in, in ways that are kind of unfortunate because they don't deal with the complexity of uh, human experience. And so we're going to talk today about um, grief that gets ahead of itself, anticipatory grief. And I want to give you that first model from Rando and talk a little bit about it. And I'll talk about why I think it's so important for ministry. So all the different forms of grief that we're going to talk about today, I want you to have a new vocabulary for grief uh, that you didn't have before you came into this class. And I want you to use that new vocabulary to see different types of grief that you hadn't seen before and respond to them compassionately with empathy. Because if you have a framework in your mind... Um, for what's happening uh, pastorally that you could draw from this clinical literature, if you have that framework in your mind, then when you go into a pastoral situation, you can help people name um, some of the aspects of what they're going through in ways that can be very comforting and very um, healing for them, uh, that can give them new insight, uh, because uh, you will have a new framework for understanding the kinds of loss that people are going through. So uh, Rando is offering what she calls a family systems perspective, um, but it's not quite the same thing as McGoldrick's family systems perspective, so you might want to take a look at both, um, both of those and put them together a little bit if you become really into this form. Um, uh, but she's really interested at put, in putting family first in uh, the experience of anticipatory grief and she says that each family has its own characteristics that impact um, the experience of, of grief, which means that the, the care for anticipatory grief is, um, is something that's going to involve the whole family. And she thinks that uh, American families are increasingly isolated or separated from one another um, in ways that are different from traditional cultures, and that this actually causes more profound psychological harm. Um, because there's more expectation on each individual family to respond to the emotional changes of grief. Um, so she wants to take, um, if last week we were talking about constructive bereavement models, so models for loss after the loss has occurred, putting the pieces back together again. Um, this, this class today is about models for loss that are very long-term. Um, that require a different kind of imagination because they go on all the time before an actual death. So this is when um, loss comes into the present and becomes like something that haunts you in the middle of life instead of being something that just occurs at the end, um, at, the, at a traumatic death or something like that, but then you put the pieces together again. Um, so I don't really think we've gotten a, a good model for anticipatory grief in uh, in our reading so far, but maybe the closest we get to it is Spearstra and Anderson or something like that. Um, so, but just picture if Spearstra and Anderson had occurred for five or 10 or 20 years, then you might have something like anticipatory grief. Um, and you might have some of the impacts that, that come from anticipatory grief. So uh, Rando, in this, in this chapter, uh, argues that uh, people are caring for a loved one for longer periods of time than they used to. And the care for someone with a terminal illness, uh, with its ups and downs, the roller coaster of, uh, of constant uh, fatigue, breeds a kind of incons inconsistency and resentment and ambivalence. So 
one characteristic of a lot of these forms of loss that we're going to talk about today, I'll try to tease out some of the differences. One of the characteristics is the loss is more long-term and it's more ambivalent. And she calls this the living and dying interval. She says for these losses, the living and dying interval um, are, is stretched out for so long that family members become the secondary victims of their illness. So in addition to a loved one who has mental illness or dementia, uh, I think dementia might be a good example for, to illustrate Rando's uh, chapter, um, families become secondary victims of that illness. That illness changes the way they function in their roles and in their life to such a degree uh, that it, it really results in a, a loss of a part of the self in relationship to the dying person. So people who are in these kinds of family situations then are having to mourn for parts of themselves that are lost because of the illness. Um, so part of the paradox for a family who has a chronic illness that goes on for a long time, um, I think people do a little bit better, a better job in society um, uh, surrounding someone who has a short, uh, dramatic illness process. But um, people who have a long-term illness process often become invisible in the result of uh, just how long the, the time frame is. And people might forget about them, and people might wonder how to give them pastoral support. Uh, they might start to disappear from religious communities, and then uh, religious communities are not sure how to respond to them. Uh, so in the light of this long living and dying process, um, uh, Rando talks about how family members must cope with a terminal illness of a family member while also continuing to take care of their family unit. So um, caregiving, uh, caregiving for a long time um, can cause people to lose track of their own families, right? Their own uh, relationships to their, so say they're caregiving for a spouse, they might not be able to respond to their children's needs as much uh, because of the stress that they're going through. And then they might not even kind of remember that there had been a, a, a disconnect there. So um, families have to, hear the, the paradox is that families have to keep functioning even as they're caring for a loved one with a terminal illness. And depending on how much stress is on a family or how many different pressures, um, if a family's pretty well off and they can pay for a caregiver, it can help a lot or pay for a respite. But if a family is kind of doing everything themselves and also working several jobs, the, the stresses on them uh, become even more intense. Um, so caregivers have to do some paradoxical things. They have to hold on to the patient and they have to let go. Um, they find themselves increasing an, uh, an attachment to the patient but also disconnecting from the patient. They have to plan for the life after death uh, of the patient while not wanting to betray the patient. Um, or be unfaithful to their uh, memory or something like that. Um, so family members find themselves uh, in a contradictory situation. So that's one of the characteristics of anticipatory grief. You're grieving ahead of time in a contradictory situation um, where your family doesn't necessarily have the resources to cope with the problems that you're facing, um, these, these opposing tasks and grief. So for us, um, Rando says, all caregivers, and just translate this into pastoral ministry, we need to find ways to recognize, normalize, and legitimate experiences of loss with, uh, with dying ones. And so we have to intervene actively to allow people to express different, a different range of feelings. Some of those feelings um, can be uh, buried by the day-to-day -day processes of caring for a loved one, and they might not or they might show up in physical symptoms that a person doesn't recognize. They start to get sick a lot, or they have other kinds of pro healthcare problems, uh, maybe wearing down particular parts of their body associated with the caregiving, and they don't necessarily realize that there's also complicated psychological factors that play into this. Um, one of the complicated psychological factors is the constellation of guilt. Um, so people who have uh, anticipatory grief in their family have a long living dying process where they feel chronically unprepared for the severity of the care and as a result they feel a grief um, that's related to guilt. Um, they don't 
feel like they can do enough for their loved ones. And um, they also might wonder or wish if the end of their loved one could come. And they might feel bad about this. And this feeling, if it's denied, can go underground and uh, cause a range of other uh, psychological problems as well. So one thing that pastors can do is just mention this feeling of guilt, this feeling of chronically not being able to do enough and feeling bad about that, and asking a person if, if they sometimes blame themselves or if they feel like they haven't done enough. And a pastor can play a, a role of blessing in that situation. Um, another thing uh, a minister can do is uh, to say that everybody in a family like this experiences feeling guilty. Everybody feels like they're not doing enough, and that can help as well. Um, one other thing that ministers can do in, in relationship to anticipatory grief, guilt, is to um, help family members pray for their loved ones in ways that release their loved ones. So if they can't be at the nursing home at a particular stressful time, you might work with family members to help them develop prayers uh, that remind them that God is still present with their loved one, even if they can't be. Um, and so you might help uh, both feel that, allow that person to connect their grief to a kind of lament in relationship to God, but also uh, help them uh, express and treat that guilt, which I think is a uh, Christian ministers and other kinds of ministers as well have a distinctive role to play in attending to that feeling of guilt, naming it, and helping people with it. Um, sorrow is uh, the next experience, first is guilt, the next experience in families is the experience of sorrow. Uh, this is the sadness, pain, and anguish that the family feels um, in, the, in relationship to their grief over losing a loved one. So um, what happens with the sorrow is that people also feel that they're going to be overwhelmed by the feeling. So it's not just grief, it's sorrow because... Um, it, it includes a perception that the grief is going to be too much for them. Um, and one way, one important point from Rando is just to note that sorrow is a part of the adaptation to the loss. You want to legitimate sorrow in others and tell them that it's okay. Um, that actually depression, in a sense, is normal in response to grieving. Um, especially what happens with a chronic loss is that a loved one often gets to a point where they lose their peer. So if a loved one is caring for someone that they care about in their life, and they're suddenly that person is no longer there as a support to them, they've kind of lost a peer, but they haven't lost their loved one yet. So it's a complicated kind of sorrow that occurs in the middle of life, um, and that makes it more difficult to adapt to. Again, um, it can be really helpful to name the extent of sorrow as a minister, um, not just sadness, but sorrow, and then normalize that and say that that's a normal response to the grief process. And so you want to tell people um, that long-term sorrow is okay, that they're actually in a situation that demands long-term sorrow. Okay, so the experience of anger and hostility is, uh, is really, at, at its heart, a, a kind of fighting um, for what has been. Um, so, and it can show up in uh, anger, um, it can show up in joking, it can show up in irritability and sarcasm, but anger um, can be directed towards the loved one. It can also be directed towards other family members for not responding to their needs. Um, and so anger, I really like the way Rando deals with anger. Like, anger is, again, a normal part of anticipatory grief. It's not a sign that something has gone wrong. Um, it's, a, it's a normal part of the entire process of grieving that comes from loving so much. Um, so she encourages uh, people an intervention in the anger itself. And I wonder how you think about this pastorally. Um, we might be comfortable naming guilt, we might be comfortable naming depression, but are we as comfortable naming anger? Um, and one of the ways, uh, I'm going to wrap this conversation about Rando up in the next few minutes. Um, but one of the ways that people can be angry is about personality changes in the illness. Um, uh, what it does to everyone involved, how it seems to take up all the energy of the entire family. Um, 
And so you might think about how can I al allow people to ask those why me questions or why my loved one questions and include a, a level of comfort with their anger. I don't know if you have that, but um, Rando is very concerned that if we don't intervene in anger, normalizing it and allowing it space, um, it's going to come out in the caregiver's life, it's going to come out in the family's life in ways that are going to be harmful for the patient. Um, so, um, let's talk just a little bit about anxiety. So, anxiety is one of the, uh, is a response to a threat to one's value. Um, and it, again, is a normal response to the demanding aspects of these kinds of long-term illnesses where the living, dying interval is long. Um, anxiety um, is often an unexpressed thought um, that includes some kind of judgment about the future. And um, the intervention in, ang in anxiety um, is also kind of a normalizing response. Uh, it's, it's a realization that someone who's in this situation has been touched by anxiety, which comes from being close to loss. Um, so the whole idea with uh, Rando's approach here is that families are grieving and they need help grieving long before the loss itself occurs with anticipatory grief. So you might think about different kinds of illnesses that cause an experience of grief that spans for a long period of time. And um, she says that in anticipatory grief, when we know ahead of time about the grief, we can help people by educating them into uh, their religious traditions or relaxation techniques. Um, we can help them to care for themselves so they don't feel like they have to distance from the patient. Um, and what she calls it is really a kind of a gradual accommodation to the threat of death, which comes from a long-term illness, um, which helps a person to kind of put that loss into a, a philosophical context. And um, she doesn't want uh, it to just be serious or uh, grave. She also wants there to be time for joy and people's uh, celebrations of delight um, at the, towards the end of their lives. Um, but she, uh, she recognizes that, um, and then she encourages people to ask some future-oriented questions. Like, um, in six months from now, what do you think you're going to be uncomfortable about, about this period in your life? So that people can start to think about how that period of anticipatory grief is going to shape their experience in the future. Um, because there are signs that unrecognized or unhealed anticipatory grief um, can, can really impact uh, the long-term grieving process. Um, so what, what uh, all of this means is that we have an opportunity um, to understand, recognize, and respond to this hidden form of grief anticipatory grief that because of the caregiving burdens in our society is really widespread and it's more common than we would have thought before. Um, some, of those, some of the ways that we can do that is just by recognizing this long interval um, where grief kind of moves from death into the present. So grief intrudes upon life and um, those people who are vulnerable are the family members who are traveling with a long-term illness that kind of is a threat to life. And that long-term illness then kind of has secondary victims that are the impacts of on particular family members. I think just in a from a personal standpoint, one of the most important things that we can do for family members is to just have them witness to one another's caregiving processes. I think sometimes when families struggle with anticipatory grief, they get shut down around their own fears, their guilt, or their anxieties that don't get expressed. And then they don't show up for the caregiving. And um, what happens if there's only one or two people doing the caregiving in the family is that um, other people can't then be helpfully involved in the medical decisions as they're moving forward. And the family can't grieve as well because they are grieving as a whole. Um, so anticipatory grief, in a sense, if it can be recognized and responded to, is a gift in the life of faith because it requires a person to gather all the resources of faith in order to respond to a crisis that's beyond any individual in that family's ability to respond. So anticipatory grief becomes a gift for the pastoral caregiver 
if they can recognize some signs of it, if they can respond to some of its telltale uh, uh, turning points, such as losing a peer, and then if they can go in and normalize things like guilt, anger, uh, anxiety, and put those into the framework of faith. What's sustaining about one's faith commitments that helps especially in the period of anticipatory grief? Um, so I hope that what we've learned together um, is that Rando's concept of anticipatory grief adds something distinctively new, and it's a new stage in grief theory um, because it brings grief into the present and helps us all see a, a kind of hidden form of grief. You might say the caregiver's grief in relationship to long-term chronic and uh, uh, progressive illnesses, which are increasing in our society. So you might be thinking, what are the ways that anticipatory grief is going to shape my pastoral practice? Um, what are some ways that I'm going to uh, move towards it, since I know it's really important to allow it to be voiced? Um, and what are some ways that I might um, even change my relationship to my own loss, my relationship to my own family, um, through an awareness of anticipatory grief and its uh, predictable impacts on families? Thank you so much for watching this, and this is... Uh, this is the introduction to the class for today, uh, Monday, March 23rd. Thank you.